All right, number one says find the limit if it exists. Um, write a simpler function that agrees with the given function at all but one point. So anytime you've got a limit, the first thing you want to do is um, plug in the x value. So if you were to plug in negative 4, you would get um, 8 times 16. No, I'm going to factor out the 8 first because I don't want to deal with that. So limit as x approaches negative 4 of 8 times x squared plus 5x plus 4 over x plus 4, which is 8 times x plus 4 times x plus 1 over x plus 4. Now, if it doesn't factor, then obviously you just plug it in, and that's your answer. Uh, but here we see that we knew that we would get 0 in the denominator, okay? If we didn't get 0 in the numerator, though, that would mean it's a vertical asymptote. Number, um, like, 3 over 0 would be um, a vertical asymptote. As it is, though, we can see that if we plug in negative 4 to the top and the bottom, then it would be um, a hole in the graph. You'd get 0 over 0. So the simpler version, their simpler equation, the simpler function, I should say, is 8 times x plus 1. So once you've got that simplified out, you can literally just plug negative 4 into that. And so 8 times negative 4 plus 1 is negative 3. So 8 times negative 3. And the answer is negative 24. Number two. <coughs> Find the limit if it exists. So if I take the limit as x approaches negative 8, that's not an 8. I just drew infinity. Okay. Of x plus 8 over x squared minus 64. Well, x squared minus 64 is the difference of perfect squares. x plus 8 times x minus 8. Um, the x plus 8 will simplify out, so I'm just left with 1 over x plus 8. The pl oh, just kidding. The plus 8s cancel out. That's good. It. Okay, so I'm going to plug in negative 8 into this one, and I end up with 1 over negative 16. So the answer is negative 1 16. Number 3. You use the graph to determine the following limits and discuss the continuity of the function at x equals negative 3. So, for the first one, the limit as you approach negative 3 from the right. As you approach negative 3 from the right, the function is approaching the y value 0. For the second one, as you approach negative 3 from the left, it's approaching the y value, um, well, I guess I would say 1. Uh, uh. Yeah? We'll go with 1. Call it good. Okay. For the third part, it says the limit as you approach negative 3. Well, without a left or a right symbol, that means you're approaching from both sides. So you only have a limit if it approaches the same y value from both sides. And they do not, because 1 and 2 are different. So this does not exist. Okay. Number 4. Number four says find the limit if it exists. Um, x approaches 11 from the right. The limit as x approaches 11 from the right, well, from the right only matters if it's a vertical asymptote. But I see that if I plug in 11 to the top, I get 0. And if I plug in 11 to the bottom, I get 0, which means it's a hole in the graph, which means algebraically I can simplify this. This is a difference for squares, x plus 11, x minus 11. And 11 minus x and x minus 11 actually just simplify down to negative 1, if you think about it. Think about it numerically. Uh, 4 minus 5 over 5 minus 4. That's oof, negative 1 over 1, which simplifies to negative 1. And that'll work no matter what you do. 4 minus 10 over 10 minus 4. That's negative 6 over 6. That's negative 1. So 11 minus x over x minus 11 simplifies down to negative 1. If you would like to think of it more algebraically, you can say factor out a negative from the top. So you could say negative 1 times. Um, negative 11 plus x, which is the same thing as x minus 11, and so you can simplify out those two. As it is, I'll go ahead and actually write that in case anyone is confused. So I've got 11 minus x and x minus 11. So we're going to factor out and say negative 1 times x minus 11. And then there we go. I'm left with negative 1 over x plus 11. Plug in 11. I get 22 in the denominator, so the answer is negative 1 over 22. Number 5. Um, wait a second. Okay, so number 5 says find the limit if it exists of uh, this expression right here. So 
The limit as x approaches 36 from the left. Again, that won't matter if it's a hole in the graph. And if I plug in 36 here, I get um, 0. And if I plug in 36 there, I get 0. So what you might remember is that, I mean, this is kind of a clue. The denominator is a difference of, if not perfect squares, then something I can rewrite. So x minus 36 can be rewritten as the square root of x minus 6 and the square root of x plus 6. And so you can see that these will simplify each other out. And there we go. We get 1 over this. Square root of 36 is 6. 6 plus 6 is 12, so 1, 12. Now I will show you one more op option because some people might not like this. Um, or might not remember it. The square root of x minus 6 over x minus 6. The only way that, oh, 36. The only other way to do this is to do an algebraic trick. Multiply top and bottom by the square root of x plus 6, the conjugate of the term with the square root. And you can see that this becomes x um, plus, 6 root, plus 6 root x minus 6 root x, so those cancel each other out, and then minus 36 over x minus 36 times the square root of x plus 6 and you can see how the square root or the x minus 36 simplify each other out and you're left again with 1 over the square root of x plus 6 so either way that's what you get okay I think you can see all the little pieces in the video. Oh well, whatever. Okay, five. Um, six. Just kidding. Find the limit if it exists. Uh, okay. So the limit as x approaches one from the left of this function. Now, I'm gonna be honest, this this question is kind of boring because uh they are the same. So I'm going to use this to talk about a couple of different things. If I ask you to find the limit as you approach 1 from the left, that means you are plugging it into the function to the left of 1. So if I were to break up the domain of this, here's 1. And to the left of it, it would be x cubed plus 10. The function would be x cubed plus 10. And to the right of it, the function would be just x plus 10. So if I ask you for the limit as you approach left from the right, you plug it into this. Limit as you approach 1 from the right, sorry, left this, right that, um, one would be, are they the same? And so in fact, if I plug in one from the left, I'm plugging it into x cubed plus 10, so that would be one cubed plus 10, which is 11. 11 is the answer. Um, it would be a more interesting question if I had asked to find the limit as x approaches one, and then you would have had to say, well, the left-hand limit is 11, the right-hand limit is 11, therefore the limit exists and it's 11. And then if I asked you, is this function continuous? And then you could say, well, the function value is also 1 because um, it's defined at 1 to be 11. So if the limit equals the function value is continuous. But anyway. Okay. <coughs> Number 8. So. Okay. Find a constant a such that the function. No, I didn't. of a such as the function blah is continuous on the entire real line. So the couple things you need to remember, you need to remember that sine of x over x looks like this. That's the one that tapers off and then um, at zero it approaches one even though it doesn't actually equal it. So when you approach um, a sine of x over x, the limit as you approach 0 is 1. Well, in this case, we're multiplying it times a negative 4. So even though this doesn't exist at 0, it doesn't matter because this is, x is less than, we could say um, from the left, the limit as you approach f of x, I don't even know why I wrote that. As you approach 0 from the left would be um, negative 4 because it's negative 4 times 1. The limit as you approach 0 of sine of x over x is 1. And the limit as you approach x, as x approaches 0 from the right, we plug in 0 into the bottom one, a plus 7 times 0. 
which is just a. In order for this to be continuous, I need these two limits to equal each other. Cool. So a equals negative 4. And there you go. So that required you to remember that sine of x over x approaches 1. So negative 4 times sine of x over x approaches negative 4. And next, 8. Determine if there is a value c guaranteed by the intermediate value theorem to which f of c equals 6, and then find the value. Show your work in determining if IVT applies. So first off, IVT, intermediate value theorem, requires um, continuity. So I have to be continuous on the interval 9 halves to 18. Well, 9 halves is 4.5, and then 18 is 18. This function is discontinuous at 3. It's got a vertical asymptote. The 3 is outside of my interval. So um, f of x is continuous on the interval 9 halves 18. Okay. Now, the other thing is you have to address, so just a reminder, IVT says that if I'm here at this x value, I'm here at this x value, then somewhere in between these two x values, I've got to equal any y value between these two y values, right? So if you say, prove to me that there's a point that it equals um, this y value. Well, I can. Um, it's just a matter of where does it occur, right? Because it could be doing something like this. It could be doing something like this. So the answer could be here. The answer could be here. It's just a matter of, well, sorry, the x value would be the answer. Where does it occur? We know it has to, though. So you have to establish that the y value that you want is in between the two y values that you, on the endpoints. So we need f of 9 halves, and we need f of 18. So if I plug in 9 halves, ooh, okay, I'm going to factor out an x. So x times x minus 5. So I get 9 halves times 9 halves minus 5 over 9 halves minus 3. Cool. Um, 5 is 10 halves, and 3 is 6 halves. So I've got 9 halves times negative 1 half. divided by 9 halves minus 6 halves, which is 3 halves. Um, so I've got negative 9 fourths times 2 over 3. I'm going to flip and multiply. So that's a 2, that's a 3. The answer is, well, not the answer, but f of 9 halves is negative 3 halves, which is negative 1.5. Okay. f of 18 is 18 times 18 minus 5 divided by 18 minus 3. So 18 minus 3 is 15. 18 minus 5 is um, 13. 18 divided by 15 simplifies down to 6 uh, fifths. Yeah. So that's um, 98 fifths. Mm -hmm. That's really annoying me. Okay, well, whatever. 98 fifths. So, 98 fifths. How many times does 5 go into 98? Um, 5 goes into 95 19 times. So, it's... Um, oh, it's 19.8, right? Watch me be wrong. I think it is. Oh, I can't handle it. Okay, 5 goes into 1 time, 5, 48, 5 goes into 48, 9 times, 45, so subtract 3, is it 19.6? Oh, yeah, 48, yeah, okay. Oh, 90, yeah, okay. Hmm. Hmm, oh, okay, yeah, duh. All right, so 19.6. <laughs> Here's the thing. The idea is, can I prove, using the IVT, that the function will equal 6 sometime between 9 halves and 18? And I can, because negative 1.5 is less than 6, which is less than 19.6. This is key, this part right here establishing that the y value that you want is in between the two y values of the endpoints, then, um, so the IVT applies. And it is true. F of, six, F of x will equal 6, or F of c will equal 6 for some c. 
So then it said, um, determine if there's a value C and then find the value. So I know that the function x squared minus 5x over x minus 3 will equal 6 at some point, right? And then it's just a matter of solving it. So we're going to multiply by x minus 3. It's a different color. And I'm left with x squared. This is going to be 6x minus 18, so I'm going to subtract that over and say minus 11x and then plus 18. And factor x minus 2, x minus 9. So the answers are 2 and 9. But it has to be on the interval 9 halves to 18, so it has to be the answer 9. Okay. All right, number nine. Number nine says find the limit, limit as x approaches 14 from the right, of x minus 3 over x minus 14. Well, so here's a situation where if I plug in the limit, I get um, a number over 0, which means there is a vertical asymptote. If there's a vertical asymptote at 14, then I have no choice. Um, well, I don't know why I said no choice. But I don't, that means I only have two options. It's either going up to positive infinity or it's going down to negative infinity. So if I'm approaching it from the right, then I'm going to plug in numbers approaching it from the right. I'm going to plug in 16. So if I plug in 16, I get... Um, 16 minus 3 over 16 minus 14. So that is, what, 13 halves? That is a positive, 6.5. And then if I plug in 15, I get 15 minus 3 over 15 minus 14. 15 minus 3 is 12. I get 12 over 1. So I'm going from 6.5 to 12. It is definitely going up. Now this isn't foolproof because sometimes the numbers can be a little bit different. But I am, in fact, going up, which means the answer is positive infinity. See ya. Number 10. Find an equation of the line that is tangent to the graph of the function and parallel to the line this. Okay. So first off, I need a tangent line. We've got to remember y minus and then x minus. So the only things I need are x, a y, and a slope. Um, tangent to this, parallel to that, which means they have the same slope. Teachers and students, pardon this interruption. All students need to report to the commons at this time. So All students on campus need to report to the commons at this time. Plus Thank you. 2y minus 18. Cole, you can stay. And so then 2y equals negative 7x plus 18, which means y equals negative 7 halves plus 9. So my slope is a negative 7 halves of this line. And then what is, so that's a slope of line. And now let's find f prime. Okay, so f of x equals 7x to the negative 1 half. The derivative of that is going to be uh, negative 7 halves x to the negative 3 halves, or negative 7 over 2, ooh, well, I could say squared. Yeah, sure. Cubed. Might be easier to say x to the 3 halves, but that is what we're doing, though, the square root and then cubed. Okay, so this is my derivative, and this is my, um, uh, the line that I want to be tangent to, right? So find the equation of the line that is tangent to the graph of this and parallel to this line. It does not have to go through this line, it just has to be parallel to it. So, the question is, when does this function right here, 7 over the square root of x, take on the slope of the line, negative 7 halves? Well, it's when the derivative, negative 7 over 2x to the 3 halves, equals the slope, negative 7 halves. Okay. So, in actuality, I mean, the 7s and the negative 7s could simplify out, the 2s could simplify out. You're really just dealing with 1 over x to the 3 halves equals 1. But, if you would like to see that, then we could say um, negative 7 over 2 equals negative 7 over 2. I'm going to multiply by x to the 3 halves and then divide by negative 7 halves. You get, or multiply by negative 2 sevenths. You get 1 equals x to the 3 halves. That is, um, again, the square root cube. So you take the cube root, you get 1. You square it, you get 1. So an x equals 1. 
So, we plug in the x value, we plug in the y value. Remember that you can come in. You can come in. Just give me one more second. And so then you plug it into the original function, x equals that, so 7 over the square root of x, so x is 1. 7 over the square root of 1 is 7, so that's the y value. And then the last part is the slope. Well, remember the whole point was to determine where this function has the same slope as this line, so the slope has to be negative 7 halves. And there's your tangent line.